in the 21st century Hard-working people Working hard for you and me Moving higher Time and time again Through the years you'll find us here Moving higher Hello and welcome to Moving Iron Podcast. Marcus with Sean Hackett. This edition of the Moving Iron Podcast is brought to you by Dawson Tire and Wheel, your premier ag tire and wheel provider in North America, helping people grow. Tractor Zoom to delivering insights and dry shod boots, the official work boot of the Moving Iron Podcast. Sean is with Hackett Financial in Boca Raton, Florida. And Sean, it's been a couple weeks. How you been, man? I'm doing pretty good. Really, uh, you know, we're we're almost out of the hurricane season window, and another couple of weeks, and we're clear. So, you know, we're just praying for another couple of weeks of good. Good weather for us, and so far it looks like that's going to be the case. So we dodged uh, dodged a lot of bullets this year, it appears, for South yep. Florida. So, yeah, the Gulf got a, got a couple that ran through there. Uh, luckily, it wasn't anything too crazy. It wasn't any Category Fives or anything like that. Lots of rain and flooding, those kind of things. But um, we had a lot of storms, but of not storms, yeah. not the big ones. The yep. big ones were, and that's good because that's what really we'd want to avoid. I mean, we can get ones and twos, and it's bad, but it's not the catastrophicness of category fives and sixes like we had over the bahamas last year where it's complete devastation so right. thank god for that yep. thank god good deal so speaking of which let's start there first so as you look at what's going on in the cotton market we had those couple of big hurricanes roll through there kind of during that kind of key cotton growing time mm-hmm. as you look at the cotton market you see right now what, what do you see happening there and what are your some of your uh takeaways from what's going on there yeah i mean we had a couple of storms that you know kind of Push the market up into overhead resistance in that 65, 67 cent area. But, you know, it really wasn't too devastating, Casey. And, you know, we're still, you know, harvest is, is, is happening and supplies are coming in. And, you know, we're just not really sure the world really needs, you know, all this cotton that's, uh, that's in the, the global system right now. And so we're feeling that markets can, uh, the cotton market can come down here and into a typical harvest uh, decline, you know, in, into uh, into November. So it's it's hard for us to see, you know, prices going much higher. You know, we're not. I wouldn't say we're like outrageously bearish, Casey, but I I just think that it's time for a normal seasonal decline. You know, and I'm, we're thinking maybe low 60s. So 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 producers that are you know needing to sell cotton right away, probably not a bad place to make some cash sales on the upper end of this trading range we've been in. Okay. All right, so let's bounce over and take a look at a couple of big winners from yesterday. You had um, corn, you had wheat, you had um, soybeans. All of those things t- kind of took off and ran yesterday after the USDA came out and reported a uh, lower than expected um, uh, ending stocks. So as you take a look at those things, we've talked about that quite a bit here. Uh, we've talked about you know, the big yields that have been thrown out there and all these different things that we see happening. A lot of that stuff starting to kind of kind of come true here as we start to look at, at what's happening in the, in the marketplace. What are your thoughts there? And, um, I mean, right now December corn, December 20 corn is is uh, 382 on the board, up three from yesterday and overnight trading. So as you look at what you see happening there, um, we're just getting closer and closer to that $4 mark. Well, I mean, we talked about this before on your program, Casey, that in, la- in in years where we have late planting and very wet conditions like last year, the USDA never gets it right. They always overestimate the yields. They never admit that they were wrong. What they do is they make changes in the following year's quarterly grain stocks report. They usually make a big change in June, which they did this year, uh, but they were so wrong last year that they had to make a, a correction downward in the September quarterly grain stocks report. Um so this is really normal behavior on the USDA's part to come clean and get the number right backhandedly. Uh, but it's one of the reasons why we were bullish in the spring is that we felt that the last year's crops were way overestimated and they were going to have to come down. And by the way, we had a 380 target, as you know, on corn that we made in the spring based upon a whole host of factors that we thought would come together. And so we've actually, you know, achieved that 380 target. And, you know, it could be four, you know, you can always, you know, we, we could get some further rise here, but for the most part, this was part of our bullish basis in the beginning of the year, uh, in the spring, and and yesterday's yesterday's report doesn't really change anything. I mean, the insiders, the commercial operators, I mean, everyone kind of knew what was on the ground here from last year. 
So this just caught some speculators who were betting on a report that wasn't going to do anything, and they were forced to cover those shorts yesterday into, into, into this morning's trade. So we've gone back, retesting the highs. It's unlikely we're going to press much higher than this, we don't think, uh, without a, a, a new catalyst. You know, South American weather in November becoming a problem, uh, China buying beyond the fourth quarter. You know, the USDA report here in, in uh, October – showing a dramatic decline in the yields. Yeah, we're going to need something else than a Coral Green Stocks report to take out, in a major way, the, the prior highs. We think this we're setting up for kind of a double top right now. And we, you know, if you're a farmer, you're out there, you're harvesting like crazy. If you've got bushels you need to sell off the field and you can't store, reward the market right now. We think this is a good short-term selling opportunity if you have those bushels that can't be stored and you and you got to pay some bills. So, yeah. Well, the Chinese are still buying. I mean, that's that's the other thing too. They're still kind of table. They're still buying um, huge amounts of of, uh, of uh, soybeans as they come uh, as they leave the U.S. here, and it seems like there's no end in sight there. I mean, they're they're obviously they're really, there's no other place on the planet right now that they can get these soybeans from. That's one of the big misconceptions about which people that aren't familiar with with what goes on in agriculture. I mean. There's only so many soybeans that get produced in a year, right? And there's, that's it. There's, there's, a, there's a finite amount of, of soybeans that get produced on the planet every year. Corn, wheat, whatever it is, everything's finite. So if, if one place runs out of it, somebody else is going to get it. And whether or not um, the Chinese are buying from us, they're buying from Brazil or somebody else, now Brazil's come to us to buy to buy beans because they've they've oversold um, their supply yep. to, to the Chinese. So um, as you look at what's going on in South America, right, um, if we head into this La Nina phase that we're that we're in right now, uh, historically it's a very dry um, growing season for for the Brazilian um, and Argentine um, agricultural crops that that are growing right now in their in their summer months as they head or I guess spring months as they head into summer. When you look at uh, what's going on in South America, the demand for beans that are going south, what are your thoughts there, and, and what do you see in that soybean market? Well, as you know, Casey, we put out our uh, South America weather report on August 23rd, and we projected that Good the stuff. planting season was going to be very, very dry. Um, and we went over all the reasons why we believe that to be the case. And it's happening exactly as we as we projected. We're getting this very, very dry pattern down there. Um, uh, and and, and we, we, we do expect that's going to continue through the majority of the planting season. So the key with that is um, how much of the crop does not get planted because of it and the the crop that does get planted, what kind of conditions does it look like as it gets established and we start moving into the actual growing season, which is really, you know, from, you know, that, 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 that emanates from there. You also have to remember Brazil has two crops, right? They get right. the first crop, which is now, and then they got the second crop, which is planted in January and February and it's harvested in the spring. Okay. Their bigger crops, the crops they export to the Chinese and else is the second crop. This crops for them. So what they're growing now is that what they want was they typically produce for them, what they need for their livestock producers, what they need, you know, to, to satisfy their domestic needs. So uh, we need to separate the two that if they are, if they're short on the first crop, that means they can export less of the second crop. Um, and so that, so it, it, this doesn't really impact uh, the, these, this particular crops, not necessarily the one that impacts directly on what they will export, but it does impact what they are able to export depending on the size of the second crop. So in, in, in Argentina, it's just one crop like we have. You know, they plant, it grows, and they harvest. So we need to kind of understand the, the, the mechanisms here. What we're talking about right now is the crop in Argentina and the first crop in Brazil. Right now, the conditions are not favorable, and we think we're going to go into the, to the yield formation phase in, in less than ideal conditions. And then we'll have to determine how the growing weather conditions are, um, you know, is moving to December onward. We'll be preparing a weather report here probably in October to go over what we see happening uh, in the growing part of the season. But right now it's a tough start, but the market really is not going to react to weather in South America, uh, Casey, until we get into November historically, when they can get a better sense of what, how planting has really gone. It, it's, it's a little too early for that, but it, but it's worrisome and something to need, we need to watch. Okay. So. so another thing that we've talked about quite a bit here on this pro, on this program is uh, 
is is sunspot activity and grand solar minimums and and how those are going to start playing into what we see happening uh weather wise moving into 21 and 22 and uh to be honest with you john sean you, you've not been wrong yet so good job oh, you know? oh god i just i've been jinxed oh no <laughs> <laughs> oh shit all right well all right let, let's get the wrong guy for us out of the way right now <laughs> so if you uh take a look what's going on there there is a uh, sun cycle 25 is coming to an end and we're we're coming out of that and there's been less sunspot activity again uh, reported at that end of that so as you look at this this developing scenario we see happening as we head out of tw- solar cycle 25 what are your thoughts there and 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 what are your what are your thoughts here moving through this this fall moving into winter of of 21 well we're going to be sending a report out momentarily uh, that you, you'll get that we got, we go over why this particular La Nina um, is going to be so um, amplified. Um, and it has to do with a, 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 a whole host of things, but the, a grand solar, and we've talked about this on your show on, on but the, a grand solar cycle changes the upper jet stream airflow from a zonal flow to a North South meridional flow that's why you can go from 101 degrees in denver to 28 degrees within 24 hours that's why you can have record heat out west and record cold in the midwest side by side like we had just recently at the same time that's how you get the iowa storm that flattened the entire corn crop in the state of iowa out of nowhere this these undulating wind currents these thrashing of cold air masses this is what the grand solar cycle does so that's the first thing but then you have La Nina, El Nino. We just experienced El Nino last year, ridiculous flooding, ridiculous delayed planting, all kinds of problems. And now the La Nina. And the reason that this is going to be such an ample, this is a two-year, we're expecting a two-year La Nina pattern, is because what happens is, is that you have what's called these convective waves that the La Nina cold sea surface temperature area produces in the atmosphere. It's called Rossby waves, R-O-S-S-B-Y waves. And they interact with the jet stream. And then we have, and we've talked about this before, the, what's called the Maiden-Julian oscillation or the MJO. And this is a convective um, a convection that goes around the, the tropical central Pacific that also sends off these waves. When they're aligned together and they're constructive, you get an amplified pattern. So normally, so, so what that means is if you get a dry La Nina signal and the MJO is aligned with that, you get an extreme drought. Or on the flip side, you get an extreme wetness. So like you're seeing this extreme flooding in China and now we're having this developing dryness in the U.S. and in South America. It's this constructive uh, Rossby wave uh, synchronization of the MJO with the La Nina, within this grand solar cycle uh, construct. And this is what our natural climate cycle analog work that we do, Casey, helps pinpoint which one of these are going to be amplified and which ones are not. Your specific question about this winter, this is not the winter that's going to hit the cover off the ball. We're not aligned for it this year. They're out of sync for the, this winter in terms of getting a cold winter. We'll have winter. It's going to be short. We'll have some, some, some nasty weather, but it's gonna, it's not, this, is, this is not the big one. Next winter, the fall of 21 through the spring of 22, that's when La Nina Rossby waves, the MJO Rossby waves, and the meridional jet stream will be in alignment for a crazy nut job, out of the ballpark, unprecedented winter season. Um, and that's really where... You know, we're very concerned of a, of a kind of a, of a early fall frost in 21, a late spring frost in 22, and corresponding droughts pre and post in the U.S., in Russia, and such forth. And so on. And that's why we're that's why we are so so concerned about this next couple of years because it's going to be a really amplified La Nina pattern like we've not seen before, um, really in our lifetimes because we've not had this setup before. Um, and, and, and in, in this report we're sending out today, the winter wheat market is really in the crosshairs of this. If, if you think about 
Drought in Russia right now. Drought in the U.S. KC areas right now. A hot, dry spring coming out of dormancy. And then, an, and, then, and then going into an early frost season in the fall, you could see how winter wheat could just be absolutely, you know. The last time we had this kind of a La Nina alignment set up, KC was 2010 and 11. It's been that long mm-hmm. since we've had one of these like this. Russia had half a wheat crop. We think right now, based upon how hot and dry it's been in their winter wheat areas, that 25% of their acreage may be abandoned, meaning they won't produce any wheat on it because they're not going to establish before they go into dormancy. And if they have any kind of spring weather problems, it could be a half a crop. You know, Casey, that Russia has become the big dog in that wheat exports. Without their wheat exports, as you said, someone's going to have to buy it from somewhere and we're going to have a big problem on our hands. So we really watch the winter wheat market uh, for signs about this La Nina really kicking into high gear. It doesn't mean corn and soybeans don't have a problem coming, but the winter wheat market is probably going to be the first one to really feel it and, and impact the grain markets, not just in a, you know, a modest way. I mean, we're talking about a significant, significant repricing higher way, and we would view that from producer side to be very patient on cash sales to you know, only sell what you have to. Try to store as much of your cash grain in the business as you can. You want to be a seller when this weather scenario really plays plays in and the, and, the, and, and the world really kind of gets its hands around how rough this is going to be for supplies. Yep. Yeah, it's a, uh, it's a very developing thing that's starting to stack up. One thing I'm worried about right now as I look at, across the entire, more you know, all of the U.S. growing market segments and, and, like you said, Russia and those kind of key other growing areas as well, you've, we're dry right now going through harvest right and and then you start taking a look at this winter and there's there's not a lot of prediction of of a lot of moisture coming this winter to kind of feed the the uh subsoil moisture to uh subsoil moisture going into plant season and in the spring you know again they're kind of leaning towards that keep hearing this thing about a drought again so you're 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 going out going into a drought you're not going to have much subsoil moisture come this this winter, and then you're going to lead into a drought this spring. So, across the board, there could be some serious issues uh, with growing across the entire spectrum. We have not had a low subsoil moisture spring, Casey, since the 10, 11, 12 time frame. Literally, we've had no. abundant subsoil moisture to start off every season. If you start off the season with a with a tank full, it's very very hard to have a fail crop. You can have an off crop. But like this year, we had great subsoil moisture. And even though we had a lot of weather problems, the crops are still going to be okay, just but not as good as people thought, right? Right. But if we had started this year, started this spring with the tank empty in, in terms of subsoil moisture, our crops would have been dramatically, dramatically lower than they are today. That is, you're, you're, you're dead on with what we see happening in the spring. And we're going to go into an amplified drought. This pasture was sort of a modified drought, drought to the west. Not so much to the east, but this coming summer, it's going to be a what we think the Palmer drought index, which last year was only 10 percent, went to 60 percent this year. We think it could reach 75 percent of the Midwest, meaning 75 percent of the acreage in the Midwest can, will experience some form of drought conditions. Yep. Um, and with no subsoil moisture, that means, you know, very, very difficult to uh, hold yields in there, you know, without extraordinarily perfectly timed rainfall which is almost impossible to happen on a broad basis yeah you know? it's hard to uh especially out in my neck of the woods we're out here uh, obviously irrigation is a big 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 part of that we also lean heavily on on uh, uh mountain snow melt to to feed the canals that come through and it, there's been years where they've shut the water off because the reservoirs aren't aren't full enough to to really uh to maintain you know the next year's you know, water issues and those kind of things you see happening. So, um, it's not just so much the sub, you know, the, the irrigation wells that are so much an issue as it is surface water coming out of the mountains. And if we have a, a, a low snowfall summer or a, snow, a low snowfall winter uh, in the mountains, it could have a, a pretty big effect on all the areas that rely on surface water for irrigation. Well, yeah, I mean, snowpack, uh, you know, though, though that, that the runoff. Uh, water rights and water that you use to water a lot of the crops is extremely important on top of the 
you know, the water that you have deep down in wells and such forth. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, without that, it just exacerbates the issue. You have to run the pivots even further. Uh, of course, every time you run the pivots, it costs a whole bunch more money. And at some point, <clears throat> you know, you know, you, you, can't, you can only run them for so long, you know. And right. so it, it, it's just a developing issue. And, it, and it's just it's going to you know, we're in a drought cycle. This is a drought. Typical Indian cycle. The only problem is it's a it's happening in a grand solar, which means amplified pattern. So amplified El Nino, historic flooding, amplified La Nina, historic drought. It's just the, it's just the cycle we're in right now. I wish I had better news. Um, the good news is it is going to cause a very very warm dry harvest, which we haven't had in a while. So yeah. harvest is going to rock. Everyone's going to make record progress. It, it, the crop's going to be dried down. They're not going to have to spend any money on natural gas and propane to dry it down. Um, that's, a good, that's the good thing. The bad thing is what's going to happen next year, as you said. So once again, sell what you have to, store the rest. You're going to want to have it available when the time comes to strike. All right. So. Okay, so let's talk about harvest right now real quick before we close it down. Um, most places are well ahead of schedule, just like you talked about here just a minute ago. Well ahead of schedule out, out in my neck of the woods here. We are probably uh, a week or two ahead uh, of where we should be, um, so if not a little bit more. Um, hot, dry temperatures have, even though we got this, the 102 degree Saturday and the 30 degree Tuesday, it was uh, in snow. It, it, we, now it's worn back up, and, <laughs> and there's still there's still plenty of stuff. Stuff's drying down quick. You know, guys out chopping are uh, are working real hard to stay ahead of the uh, of the moisture content and keep and keep things rolling as much as they can. But um, most people are going to be done uh, well well ahead of where they've been the last three or four years. If you really take a look at, at what the average is, so. Um, what are your thoughts there, and how, what are your anticipations now that when harvest gets done four weeks earlier than normal, um, now that the traders have some time to think about all the stuff that's going on, USD, USDA reports are going to come out probably a little bit earlier and more accurate than they have in the past. What, what kind of impacts are you looking forward going through the, the fall into the first of the year? <laughs> well, the fact that we're going to have this record pace harvest means that we're going to have a lot more supply available much, much quicker than we normally would. And that, that's going to be a bearish short-term factor. We still think, despite yesterday's rally, that once again, we're, we're in a kind of a corrective congestion phase while this harvest really gets going. Um, and, and the USDA will be far more accurate on dry crops, early harvested crops. You know, they're, they're going to be far more accurate and they're going to be far more current in getting to the right answer. So we're not going to have to wait six, nine, 12 months for them to come to the right answer about what last year's crop was. You know, we're going to get that answer, you know, by, you know, the, the October, November reports, we're going to kind of know really quickly where we are. And so that's good in terms of it gives the right price signal um, currently. And so that's something we have, as you said, we have not had a early harvested dry crop year in a long time. And, it, and we've always had to painstakingly wait for the USDA to come clean many, many months out. The good news is we're going to get an answer very, very fast here about what the truth really is, and then we can price it in and move on to what's going on in South America. So take advantage of this window to get harvest going. Um, you know, it's, 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 it's a good time, and it's going to be a, a finally an easy time for, uh, you know, for farmers to get the crop out of the field for once and, and not have to let <laughs> a lot of acres sit in the field over wintertime like they have the last couple of years. It's, uh, it's finally going to have a good season. So Knock on wood. At least that's good news for the farmer that he can get his supplies, get it in the bin quick, and get it dry and have it dry down before he has to do anything. So, yeah, yep. Well, good stuff as usual, Sean. Um, a lot of stuff to think about, a lot of stuff to plan for as we move forward here through uh, the rest of this year and what we see happening in the uh, next, you know, twelve to eighteen months heading into some some larger weather patterns. If folks want to reach out to you, Sean, and get more information about what it is that you do at Hackett Financial, what's the best way to do that? Our website is Hackett, H-A-C-K-E-T-T, advisors.com. There's a lot of things on there they can listen, watch, and read to see if what we do might be of value to your listeners. Right on, Sean. Well, I'm Casey Seymour with Moving Iron Podcast. Make sure you check me out on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram for all the latest Moving Iron Podcasts as they drop. Also, check out Moving Iron LLC for the latest information about the Moving Iron Summit being held January 20th through the 22nd. In Nashville, Tennessee, Sean will be there, and he'll be giving a, a great report about uh, about what he sees happening moving forward in this uh, in this twenty one um, 
22 time frame and what that what, what that looks like for uh, for producers and uh, the folks in the equipment business. Also, uh, check out all the uh, great podcasters on the Global Ag Network. And with that, I am Casey Seymour, Sean Hackett. Let's go move some iron, folks. Out. Moving higher in the 21st century. Hardworking people working hard for you and me. Moving higher time and time again. Through the years you'll find us here.